I, I just don't think I'd make it through that. Uh, Jonathan, uh, welcome back. Thank you, Art. Um, you don't have a weak heart, I take it. Actually, I've had two heart attacks in the last 10 years. You do have a weak heart. Um, okay, I, but this was 96. Right, right. I didn't know any better. You're lucky it didn't go then. Oh, absolutely. All right, here you are. Be, you're, you're trying to crawl away from this thing. You crashed into it. It's making you sick. Really sick. Well, I wasn't sure what was making me sick, except I knew something in the whole area was was causing me to feel sick mm -hmm. and me to feel out of out of anything that I felt natural with. Mm -hmm. My world was gone. This was a totally unusual, unparalleled feeling of being out of your own element. Uh, I mean, I, I thought I was either completely going insane or that I was going to die from this sickness just from the fact that my body was becoming so dehydrated, and, and I just couldn't control it. And after I fell against this thing for a brief second, just for a minuscule second, I almost mm. felt like I was inside of it and then got thrown out. You felt it? Um... It felt like it was an intelligent machine. Okay. Like it almost was trying to figure out if I was maybe the little guy that I knocked down. Oh. Maybe because I was the only two-legged breathing thing crawling around, maybe it was looking for its, its uh, partner. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm going to ask you for the impossible, but how do you, I mean, I understand that you felt it. It was, a, in effect, in you, and you felt a kind of a machine, but um, is there any way to put that really into words? What does a machine feel like? Well, being that it was making this sound, being that it was creating this sound. This big humming sound. And when I touched it, that humming changed. Right. That gave me the indication that, you know, this was somehow generating this sound. And it was so obscure to see this thing in the middle of the woods so out of place, but yet hanging two feet above the ground, not, I need to really reference that. It was not moving a fraction of an inch, right? but yet it was there. It was anchored above the ground. I mean, well, I, I, yeah, I, that's what you said, anchored, um, which is an interesting way to, I, you know, I would have said floating, but you're saying anchored. So yeah, stationary, a hundred percent stationary. When you crashed into it, you didn't budget. Not a, a fraction. Made almost no sound as far as me trying to put my hands on it or leaning against it. It almost felt like it was kind of absorbing the sound. Now this could have been all an illusion because of my sickness, as far as the overall sound. Mm -hmm. But I carried on to say to myself, well, uh, I, I guess it's here. I guess this is in front of me because it's tangible. It ripped the skin off of my hand. Uh, I know that didn't just happen with the tree branch. Uh, and I can't move this thing. And it's making a sound. And for a brief second, I felt almost like it was... It was trying to identify something, mm -hmm. and then maybe I wasn't it. But this is speculation after years and years of thinking about this. I mean, at the time, I had no idea. I was just going completely out of my mind, trying to find some logic to hold on to, because nothing 
made any sense. And I knew that my body alone was quickly becoming in severe state of shock. And I was conscious of that. I was conscious of the fact that I couldn't breathe. I, I was gasping for air. And when you do this for a long period of time, you almost lose consciousness and then come back because mm-hmm. of the, you know, the whole air process of your body. So I was readily aware that my body was going into shock. So my mind was survival. My mind at that moment was survive this. Mm-hmm. So at that moment I said, okay, I got to get some water. I have to get some water in me because I had emptied all of the water in my body that I had between throwing up and and losing control of all of my functions. So you were in shock. You were severely dehydrated. And I was aware I needed to get some water, and I had some water in my pack. I always take things with me when I go on a day hike. When you've done it for years and years, you realize there's certain things you take with you. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I had some dog treats. I had... Uh, a thermal blanket, I had a first aid kit, um, some of the just bare essentials. I had water, a water canteen, I had a couple of cans of soda, um, and I knew I had water in my pack. And to me, to focus on this at that point gave me great solace, gave me great, restored some idea that I was thinking a little bit clearly. So I focused on that, and I actually crawled back up, which was probably 200 feet to where my pack was, where I had left the pack. And I grabbed it, and I sat there, and I drank the water, and I drank some of the the soda, and I realized I've I've got my camera with me in the pack. Now, and that's that's some pretty clear thinking uh, after you've described the condition you were in. Uh, well, I had to take the camera out to get to the water. Right. It wasn't clear thinking. It was just the process of illumination. And at that okay. moment, at that moment, Art, in my None of this is real. I was actually thinking to myself, this has to be all an illusion. I have, you know, somehow, you know, hurt myself or or fell down or had some kind of massive stroke, and I am now living in this illusion. That's what my mind was telling me because Mm -hmm. none of it felt real. So when I saw my camera, I thought, well, I'm going to take a picture of this, and none of it will come out. And then it'll prove to me that this nightmare is not going on. That was my thinking. I my thinking understand. was, yes. I've got this in my hand. I know how to use a camera. You know, I was a pretty good amateur photographer. Photography was kind of my hobby. Sure. So I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just prove to myself that this isn't here. So I grabbed my cameras, I walked back over to where this was, I took some pictures of the body crawling around on my hands and knees, I crawled back over to where this black floating shape was, I I tried to clear some of the brush underneath it away right? so that it was even clearer that it wasn't touching the ground, and as I did that, as I tried to clear some of the ferns away underneath it, there was a feeling as I as I moved this stick, this branch to pull away the, the ferns, like there was a density of the air underneath this thing that was different than the air around it, almost like a branch or a board in water. Yes. When, you, when it enters the water, it has a resistance that's different than the air. And this was the same thing, except it was just the air underneath this object that was more dense. 
And again, I couldn't explain it. I, I don't, I didn't even want to rationalize. All I'm doing is seeing it in front of me. And I'm focusing on, okay, take the picture. Don't think of anything else. Just work your camera. You know how to work the camera. It was pretty much automatic anyway. And I concentrated on that. I totally focused on uh, almost obsessively on take the pictures, Jonathan. Sure. And because it gave me, again, some kind of promise of logic because I knew how to take the picture. I knew how to take the film out of the camera and reload it. And I just kept saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take this. I'm doing this now. I'm taking the picture. And I did. And I also had a video camera with me. And I videotaped this whole area under the oh, yeah. state and you, condition. You had, recovered a, you, you had really recovered a lot to be doing that. Um, Actually not, Art. If you hear the videotape, I am so hyperventilating and so stopping and so throwing up during the videotape that it's clear that I was not recovered. Art, I, I am just a man, and I was running on pure adrenaline and only holding on to that logic that kept me moving forward because I didn't want to think about what had happened, what had happened with my dog, what had happened with this creature, what had happened to me. I didn't want to mm -hmm. think about it. I wanted to just be healthy. I wanted to just come out of this uh, nightmare at the moment. So that was the only logic going on. Okay. Now, Art, you've had some of those photographs from years ago. Oh, you yes. even had the negatives. Oh, yes. Uh, listen, folks, these photographs are so clear. I wish the ones that we had up on the website for you right now were as clear as the original photographs. They were so clear that people raised hell about it. Um, usually it's, um, oh, you know, it's a fuzzy photograph of a UFO. This was so clear that people complained. And uh, uh, Dr. Reed is right. I have the negatives to these photographs. Story over. And we also had other people, you know, independently look at the negatives and look at the videotape. And it is exactly what it is. It's just normal negatives, normal positive prints. There's was no, there any no reaction? Yeah. Was there any reaction to uh, either by the object or um, the, the creature? to the photographs being taken? Well, as far as I was concerned, the uh, the creature was dead. dead. I mean, dead. his yes. skull was broke open. There was a two-inch hole in the back of his uh, skull. It had cracked the intracranial sac. The blood was everywhere from it, and was it, it was wasn't. It red, was it red blood like ours? Yes, exactly like ours. <laughs> um, Is it... it, it impression that the obelisk was a vehicle or was it a companion or what was it well i've never felt it was a craft many people have said it was a craft mm -hmm. i have felt that it was something else but it was in my mind it was alive it was it was readily sensing the area and or causing my body to be in such distress. Maybe it was mm -hmm. a defense mechanism. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it could have been a portal to another dimension. It could have been a doorway or a toolbox. Okay. Um, from its size, uh, you wouldn't think it would be the craft. But as you point out, it could be still a means of travel from wherever to here. Yes, yes. And since then, I've talked to lots of people all over the world who have also seen the same shape, the same dimension, the same object, many, many, many different places and over the last 
hundred years. Now, that's really interesting. Uh, in other words, after you originally told this story on my program, uh, you did a lot of what, touring? Um, well, I, I, once, once you allowed me to tell my story, mm-hmm. and you were the exclusive first, first point of me going public, uh, a lot of people inquired. A lot of people wanted to to listen to understand what I'd gone through, and I I I felt at the time that I, I guess this is what I need to do: is I need to to tell people. I need to share this with people. Well, I, I don't blame them. Uh, anybody, for example, even right now, and it's almost as though you're remembering more than you did then. Um, Anybody listening right now is going to be aware that this is a serious story of contact. So yes, I'm not surprised that. Uh... Well, you know, it's 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 serious. But what I want to add in is, I've since learned, Art, that there's thousands of people who have oh, very yes. similar stories. They just I know, but 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 they don't have very similar evidence. That's right. That's right. They either were smart enough not to bring it forward, or they just didn't have it. Look, I'm I'm not. Uh, I was not experienced into this. I was never a believer or even a prescribed uh, interest into this field. I didn't even like science fiction. I was a a, a serious scientist, a doctor. That works with logic. So this was totally out of my element, not even of my interest at the time. So my whole paradigm began to collapse because I could not find any logic. You realize, and I'm sure you've met with this, uh, that these kinds of stories, uh, doctors, scare people. And pe- when people get scared, they get defensive and they start screaming hoax and all the rest of it because it scares them. It, it really scares them. And well, I, I don't, well, like I, don't like, I, like I said at the beginning, Art, if this hadn't happened to me, I wouldn't believe it either except for the fact that there's a lot of physical evidence. Oh, and and if there wasn't physical evidence, including photographs, including video, and including some other things, then I definitely can see how people would be, you know, hard to see it as being anything other than just a story. Sure. All right. Well, let's pick up because there's so much more to it. Now, you've taken the photographs. Taken then the photographs. I, I put everything. Video kind of crawled back to where I had dragged the pack and drank the water. I drank more. I I tried to rest. I tried to not hyperventilate so much so that Smart. my body could kind of stabilize. But still it was in a state of, of flux. It was not at all calming down. Right. But I felt more, shall we say, more stable, maybe just because I was doing something and accomplishing something with the photograph. Well, yeah, something familiar that, that, right. that will really help you when you're in shock. And so when I was putting all this, you know, taking the cameras out of my bag and, and grabbing the water, you know, I pulled everything out of the pack, out of my day pack, and I just kind of, you know, threw it on the ground as I was grabbing for the water. Well, one of the things that I had was a thermal blanket, which is, for people who don't know, it's a, it's a mylar-type material, mm-hmm. plastic, that you can wrap yourself up in if you find yourself in the snow or if you find yourself in distress in the woods to keep your body temperature from, you know, reducing. It really works. Oh, they really work, and they're very, very lightweight. I mean, it's it's nothing more than a very thick uh, plastic wrap, actually. But it's strong. It's got some strength to it. Mm-hmm. Well, I had pulled this out, and, and it was all in a little package, you know, all folded up in a little package. And I, it's it's kind of a silvery gold color. And I 
I'm sitting there with my cameras and, and putting kind of stuff back in the, the pack, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? Now what am I going to do? Right. It's it's an hour and a half back to my Jeep from walking comfortably when I arrived. Now I'm crawling on the ground. What am I going to do? <laughs> so I thought, well, I got to I gotta take this body, and, and in my mind I'm thinking, I got to take this body and put it somewhere where the animals won't get to it. You know, I think I would have been afraid to touch it. Well, I was. I was afraid to touch it. I was in fear of everything. But my mind logically said, cover it up. Cover it up so I don't even have to look at it at this moment. That I get. So I tore open this firm thermal blanket from its package. I opened it up, and I spread it out over the, over the top of this body and just left it like that for quite a while, just not looking at it anymore. Just kind of letting my mind go away from it. And that felt better. It felt better not to look at it. So I thought, okay, well, maybe I should take some rocks and place around the edge of the blanket so that, you know, animals don't, don't get at it. Well, there weren't any rocks. And, and I, it just is, it's high enough in the, in the woods and the mountains where there just wasn't any exposed rock, loose rocks. Right. And I thought about, well, maybe I can find some more branches and pile it next to the edge of this little rise, this hill, and just kind of cover it up. So, you know, later maybe I can come back and bring somebody back and, and uh, you know, try to figure out what this is. Because I didn't of know what, what I had killed. I didn't. You, I, didn't. You, I understand. You, you never gave any thought, did you, to try, trying to drag this thing back to your car? Well, yes, at that point, Art, I decided I would cover this thing up, and I tucked this thermal blanket under the body without touching it. I didn't want to touch it at all. And I just kind of wrapped it up like a burrito. Like can a you, sleep can I, uh, okay, qu quick question. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be barging in, but... A sense of, uh, maybe you didn't get it from dragging, but do you have any sense of how heavy this thing was? Well, when I when I pushed the thermal blanket underneath the edge of it, I moved the body. I could feel my, my hands and my arms moving the body, and mm -hmm. I felt surprised that it was so light in weight, that it was so extremely light. This was the size of a 12-year-old. Child. Oh. oh, that's pretty big. Yes, it was about 53 to 56 inches in, in total height. But it weighed probably 50 pounds. <sighs> so it just didn't make any sense. Of course, nothing made any sense. So why should that be anything different? And at now, that didn't, point... Did, did, didn't you tell me you were uh, an hour, hour and a half from your car? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I wrapped okay. it up. I, I folded the, the ends around it. I took the straps of my pack and put around it to lift it up like a sling. And I was going to drag that over mm -hmm. to the edge of this hill and cover, put branches on it if I could find them. Well, when I picked it up, I realized, you know, this is amazingly light. That's in, It's just incredible. So I took it over to the edge of this hill as best I could, stopping to throw up. And I really couldn't find any branches right there. So I decided, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk up, put my pack in one hand and this thing in the other. Mm -hmm. It created a balance. And I, I'm going to find a place to put this. And then I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to go to my Jeep because at that time it was getting later in the day. At that point it was, you know, past probably 3.30. And late in, in October it starts to get dark. Right. And I knew okay. I needed to get out of there. All right. So this was uh, now 
maybe two and a half hours or so into the incident, right? Right. All right. Doctor, hold it right there. We've, we've got to take a break. And uh, this is some story, and you're far from done, folks. All right. Well, Dr. Reed is going to be back in a moment. And um, I don't know about you, but with this story, I need these breaks. You're listening to Dark Matter, exclusively on Sirius XM. We're going to pick the story right back up again because there is so much more to it. My guest is Dr. Jonathan Reed. And uh, Dr. Reed, uh, just as we continue the story, uh, somebody's asking, you know, I get these messages, uh, what kind of doctor you are? Developmental psychiatrics, child development. I was a research counselor for kids. Excellent. Thank you. Proceed. So here we are, uh, and now you're dragging this thing. Well, uh, liter- it, it, literally, I was carrying it um, because if fi- I say that's dragging, that's fifty pounds. That's fifty pounds, doctor. People uh, will say the thermal blanket would have been torn to shreds, and they're right. I see you've been interrogated on the story before. <laughs> uh, Art, I, I have lived A with this times. for yeah. seventeen years. I'm sure. And I, I appreciate everyone's questions. Let me just say that. And I, again, I have no problem in people either not believing it or believing it because it is hard to believe unless you experienced it. You know what? Having pictures and witnesses doesn't hurt. All right, so you carried this thing 50 pounds. That's a lot of weight to carry, uh, you know, for an hour or an hour. Well, well, I thought so, too, and I, I would carry it. I would stop. I would drink some water. I would throw up, uh, and I would carry it again. And what's amazing is all of a sudden I ended up back looking at my Jeep and thinking, how did I get here? Sure, how, did I, how did I get here? here in such little time, what felt like 10 or 15 minutes, and it didn't make any sense. But, of course, nothing made any sense at that time. Um, Nothing, there was no reality except what I was looking at, what was in my hand, you know, was, was my key for my Jeep, and that looked comfortable. That looked like home to me. And... All I remember is opening the back of the Jeep, putting my pack in this this package that was fairly small, wrapped up in this thermal blanket, putting it in the back of my Jeep. And I remember sitting in the driver's seat, closing the door, and just sitting there for, for some time, not not starting the car, not just kind of zoning out, thinking... You know, just thinking nothing. And then I looked over and I realized Susie wasn't sitting in the seat next to me like she always was. And I right. and I knew something had happened, something. Was there and, any, uh, may I ask a question? Was there any, at any point when you touched, even through the thermal blanket, I, I guess you wouldn't know. I'm just curious whether there was any warmth uh, to the body of this creature or stone cold or, you know, anything? It, it was for all my, all of my logic, it was dead. It was not breathing. It was right. not moving. Uh, its skull was broke open. There was blood oh. and brain so. material coming out that, of that hole. Gotcha. Uh, As Rush would say, room temperature then. Any time that I moved it or touched it, it never moved. Mm-hmm. So it was just dead weight to me at that point. And, you know, I want to say again, I, I didn't have any great plan. This all came out of nothing more than a survival feeling of getting back to some kind of reality to where I could address being so sick and I could calm down 
and and trying to find some way to put this in perspective. All right. Somebody named Heather is asking, was there any scar on your hand from having touched that ship or that, that sure. obelisk? Sure. The inside there was. Of, yeah, the inside of the palm of my hand, the skin was torn off. So, but, you know, over 17 years, that's kind of healed. Healed, right. You know. Did, did you document the injury? I don't think I did at that time. I, I don't think okay. that was uh, my focus. I had bigger things to worry about. Oh, I, I can clearly see that, yes. Uh, and in uh, the next, you know, in the next few days, it got even worse. So I drove home. I started to drive home from that space, that that place in the forest where I parked my car. Drive for, you know, a, a few miles, and then I'd stop, and I'd have to open the door and throw up. And then I'd drive a little farther, and then I thought, okay, there's a ranger station up here. I'm going to go there. I'm going to get help there. These guys will help me, you know, forest sure. rangers. Yeah, of course. So I got off, you know, where it said forest ranger station. I drove a couple of, I don't know, about a mile and a half to where it was. I got out, and there was nobody there. The mm -hmm. place was locked up tighter than a drum. I don't know if they were out to dinner or what, but there was no one there. Okay. So I got back in my Jeep, and I said, I, you know, got to go where I got to go, and I'm going home, you know, and I just drove home in kind of a numb state. And all I remember was the headlights on the road because it was starting to get dark, and I remember pulling in the carport at my, at my house right. and thinking, I'm here, I'm home, and maybe none of this happened. Maybe it's just some kind of sick illusion that I have ruled really because Maybe my dog got killed by an animal, and I just can't fathom this idea. I don't know. That's because but the brain doesn't want to digest this kind of information as having really happened. That's well, I, and it I, doesn't. It. it doesn't know how to put this in perspective. Was anybody home at the time? No, no. Uh, I lived at, alone, and I sat in the carport for a while, and I, I just thought, you know, thought about it. And looked in the rearview mirror, and I could see the top of the thermal blanket. Hmm. And I thought, okay, I got to do something. I got to get out. I got to get away from this. I got to, I don't know, I started thinking about marrying it. I started, started thinking about leaving it somewhere else on somebody else's doorstep. Uh, I mean, my mind was whirling. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean to laugh. I, no, I'm no. Just, you know, I'm just thinking uh, if, if you had done that, uh, then you might have been really responsible for a heart attack. Well, exactly. I mean, I probably would have taken it, you know, to the university that I, that I worked at or something like that. But I was so sick. I just didn't want to do anything. So what I did was simply take it out of my Jeep because I didn't want somebody to steal it. I didn't right. want somebody to find it and have it kill them by shock. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking, but I thought I got to get it out of my Jeep. And my Jeep right. is right next to my my garage, which is an exterior building not connected to my house, a two-car garage. And I thought, well, I'll just put it in there. So I opened the inside door, small, you know, door to my garage. Sure. And walked in, turned the light on, and right in front of me, against the far wall, was my freezer. A big coffin-like freezer. Coffin-like. And I thought, this will hide it. This will preserve it. This is dead meat.
in kind of a numb state. And all I remember was the headlights on the road because it was starting to get dark. And I remember pulling in the carport at my at my house right. and thinking, I'm here, I'm home, and maybe none of this happened. Maybe it's just some kind of sick illusion that I have through because of the trauma of my dog dying. Maybe my dog got killed by an animal, and I just can't fathom this idea. I don't know. That's because but, the brain doesn't want to digest this kind of information as having really happened. That's well, I, and it I, I doesn't. It. it doesn't know how to put this in perspective. Was anybody home at the time? No, no. Uh, I lived at, alone, and I sat in the carport for a while, and I, I just thought, you know, thought about it, and I looked in the rearview mirror, and I could see the top of the thermal blanket. <laughs> And I thought, okay, I got to do something. I got to get out. I got to get away from this. I got to, I don't know, I started thinking about burying it. I started, started thinking about leaving it somewhere else on somebody else's doorstep. Uh, I mean, my mind was whirling. <laughs> I'm and, sorry. I don't mean to laugh. I, no, I'm no. Just, you know, I'm just thinking uh, if if you had done that, uh, then you might have been really responsible for a heart attack. Well, exactly. I mean, I probably would have taken it, you know, to the university that I that I worked at or something like that. But I was so sick, I just didn't want to do anything. So, what I did was simply take it out of my jeep because I didn't want somebody to steal it. I didn't want somebody to find it and have it kill them by shock. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking, but I thought I got to get it out of my Jeep. And my Jeep is right next to my, my garage, which is an exterior building not connected to my house, a two-car garage. And I thought, well, I'll just put it in there. So I opened the inside door, small, you know, door to my garage. Sure. And walked in, turned the light on, and right in front of me, against the far wall, was my freezer. A big coffin like freezer. Coffin like. And I thought, this will hide it. This will preserve it. This is dead meat. It's going to go bad. And at least I don't have to look at it. And so I put it in the freezer. I literally just put it, opened the top of the freezer and lowered it down and thought, it's out of sight, out of mind, and now I'm going to go in the house and stand in the shower. And this was uh, over your meats and frozen food? No, there wasn't, there wasn't much in that freezer. There was a, a separate rack that I just Good. took out that had some frozen things, you know, and I just... I, I, Art, I didn't care. I didn't care. I wanted it out of my sight. Well, actually, the, a freezer is a logical place to put a body that you want to preserve anyway. Well, I don't know that I wanted to preserve it as much as I just <laughs> wanted to get it out of my hands right. and, and out of sight and mind for the moment. That was the logic. Again, I was not thinking very clearly. I was thinking step by step just to just to get to the next point where I could calm down and, and not be throwing up and filling my pants. So I closed the garage door. I walked in the house, and I did exactly what I said. I stood in the shower with all my clothes on for I don't know how long, just letting the water run all over me and I didn't even take your up. clothes off. No. Okay. No, I um, was a, I was a mess, Art. I bet you were. Um, I, I, and by the way, everybody, listen. If you want to see, by now I know you do the associated photography. Uh, even though it's original best, uh, it's up on the website artbell.com. Pictures of the creature. Pictures of the obelisk we've talked about. Pictures of all of this. So go take a look. And I know people are doing this 
uh, in incredible amounts because it's beginning to crash my ability to read questions. Well, even our <laughs> website has crashed twice since we've been yeah. on the air. So. Yeah, I'm sure Keith is doing backflips over there. Um, but that Kudos to really Keith. <laughs> well, he's just, he's like I am, you know, sort of cranking up, getting going. So I, I understand uh, he's probably added another server or two by now. All right, so the thing's in the freezer. You're in the shower. And, and I get out. I try to calm down. I try to drink water. I try to sit down. I can't. I'm I'm laying down. I'm, I'm thinking. I, I am just, I'm feeling a little better maybe 10% better, so I'm not panicking, trying to think, well, I've got to go to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. But I'm now thinking this had to be trauma. This had to be trauma-induced by the fact that my dog was killed in front of me by an animal, and that's what my mind wanted to believe. My mind started to create this scenario while I was in the house, while I was calming down, that this was the only logical answer, that this must have been an animal and that killed my dog, and I just, for some reason, spaced out. I just well, lost. Somewhere in your mind, oh. though, you, you knew, number one, there's something I put in the freezer, and number two, I took a whole lot of photographs. Well, so. at, that, at that point, at that point, Art, I was thinking... What's got to be in the freezer is my dog, Susie. Oh. That's what I had to have wrapped up. That's what I yeah. had to have brought home. I truly understand. And, uh, I, and I felt comfortable thinking mm -hmm. that. Sure. Because it made more sense. It was more realistic to me that that is very logical, that that could have happened. So I convinced myself that that's basically... What it was, and I even got dressed and went out to my garage and said, "Absolutely, this is this has got to be Susie." And I opened the freezer and I lifted it out and set it on the garage floor. And it wasn't it wasn't Susie. Somebody's asking, was there a smell? Yes, there was. It had a terrible pungent odor that I have. I have decided that it's similar to rotting fruit, mm. the, the odor of rotting fruit. Right. And it, it wasn't pleasant, and it was always there. And it didn't even seem to diminish much, even after it had been in the freezer for a couple of days. But to to continue, I... Yes. I saw that it wasn't my dog. I put it back in the freezer. I went in the house, and I'm now thinking I got to call some people. I got to get some help for me with this. I'm, you know, trying to keep from going into shock again. So I called, started calling my friends, and you know, you just pick up the phone. Telling those who are most familiar that you call. That's what I would do, too. I, you know, if you really think about it, would you call the police right away? Well, no, maybe not, because you just think you thought well, you killed I, something. Well, I, I was even a little concerned about calling the police right. because I, right. I had killed something. And I didn't know if there was some kind of uh, uh, legality to this that maybe I should pursue through a lawyer first. I, I mean, Could've, my yeah. mind was reeling, Art. With you all the way. With you all the way. And at that point, comfort seemed to, con to be to contact my friends who knew me, who I knew. And so I just did that. I called my girlfriend. She wasn't home. I left a message. Call me, please, imme immediately. I called other friends that I worked with. They weren't available. I called my very best friend, Gary, and I left him a message, and he called me back within just a few minutes. And I literally said, help me. I'm, I'm sick. My dog has been killed. <laughs> Susie's dead, and, and I'm home, and I need some help. And he said, I'll be there. And he immediately came. And I told him the story, and of course,
first he didn't believe me, but he he was my good friend for many, many years, and he listened. So he and came. He, he knew I was sick. He came and sat in my living room. Mm-hmm. And I, I said, well, it's it's true. It is true. It's, And he said, well, Jonathan, you know, we all... We all go through difficult times, and I'm sure you're, you're sure feeling... Sure, you probably got a bad bump on the head, buddy. Right, exactly. Yeah, and exactly. and what can I do for you? And and I got angry, and I said, come with me, and I'm going to take you and show you. And he's reluctant, and he's saying, Jonathan, you know, you just need to rest. You just need to calm down. Mm. And I took him to the garage, and I opened the freezer, and I laid it on the floor. And I showed him, and I said, tell me that you don't see this. Tell me this isn't what you see. And Gary's reaction? Well, his jaw dropped open, and he was speechless And for some time. And uh, I don't know that he, well, he said a few expletives Mm -hmm. that even for serious radio shouldn't be said. That's quite right. We get the idea. At that point, he kind of backed up against the against the wall, and I said, "Well, I got to put this back in the freezer." And he just stood there; he didn't say anything. And I walked by him, and he was just like in a trance. And I said, Shocking. "I got to go in the house. I got to sit down." Shocking. And and he followed me in, and he sat down and just sat on my in my living room, uh, almost speechless. And I said. It's true. This happened. And and he just looked at me and he said, it's incredible. And I said, I have videotape. You want to see it? And he just, again, stared at me like I was insane. And I took the videotape that I, that I actually recorded in the forest and I played it on my television. And... It was there. It was all there. The the black floating object, the body, uh, the did white he, ash from my yes, dog. Did, did he regain enough of his sensibilities after watching all of this to give you advice? To yes, after <laughs> after some time, after drinking about a half a bottle of scotch. No. <laughs> Uh, we, that we, I get. <laughs> you know, he came to the point where he says, well, I know what this is. And I was said, no. Was that the both of you? Was that the both of you consuming the scotch? Or? No, I was pretty no. sick. And I didn't want to I didn't want to go there. I was just drinking as much water as I could get in me. But but he finally said, he says, Jonathan, I know what this is. Oh. And, I, and I kept saying, uh, no, I don't know. I don't know what this is. I don't know. And he said, it is. It's got to be some kind of extraterrestrial or right. some kind of biological creature that somebody created. Well, I'm just looking at the photographs, and I'd say definitely E.T. Well, I didn't want to go there because that wasn't comfortable for me. That wasn't part of my world, and it didn't mm-hmm. make sense to me. I was not a believer. I was not into that type of thing. But he was sure. He was adamant. He was almost excited. And I said to him finally, I don't want to have anything to do with this. I want to get better. I want to get well. And he said, well, we need to tell some people. And I said, no, we don't. We need to be careful. They're in my house apart. I don't want, you know. And that's what would have happened. Well, that's finally what did happen, Art. Right. I know. Uh, we'll get there. So, uh, okay, there's so much more to this. Um, so how did it end up with Gary? I mean. Well, Gary was a complete believer at that point. I mean, yeah. you know, when it's in front of your face and you can touch it and feel it and look at it. It's undeniable, uh, you know, when it's when it's in front of you, in person. There's no question that you're looking at something that wasn't human, and that was some kind of biological creature. Mm-hmm. Um, he was adamant. He was 
excited and wanted to to get this to people who could do something with it and and investigate it and and uh, take it take it. I wanted people to take it away. That's what I wanted. Mm, I, I understand literally, that. I literally it. wanted to be done with it. So right. when he started to tell me there are people who who are into this and and will help you, will help us. Now it was us. Now it was his project. And I <laughs> and I was happy at that. I was very happy mm-hmm. for that. Because I really didn't want to deal with it in so many ways. But he said, we're going to call some people. We're going to start making some inquiries on who would be the best to uh, to talk to. And he said, we talked about this at long length. I said, well, we can bring some of the other professors that I work with at the University of Washington. That would have been good. Anthropology people, you know, that other other sure. medical doctors we can all bring in. Well, we made a list. We started calling those people. Some of those people came to my house. Some of those people saw the body. Some of them didn't come. And how, this many was how, how many? Dur- during, during the first nine days, and there's a reason I'm referencing nine days. Okay. There were probably, including Gary and myself, there were probably eight other people. Right. Or, or, or ten, let's say ten people. And that included some of my own family, some of my, I mean, my girlfriend, uh, some very good close friends of mine, and some people that I worked with who I respected. So there was no question that this was really there because Mm -hmm. other people saw it. Other people even took pictures of it. But to make the story... uh, Long story short, the the sanity of this was short-lived because the next day when we started to call, when Gary started to call people, we started to realize that there was funny sounds on our phone. There was extra little click sounds on our phone. And I thought, really? well, you know, why is that, you know? And then we called some people who were from supposedly the MUFON group, Mutual UFO Network. Yep, I was going to ask about that. And we told them, what if somebody had something like this? Kind of similar to the facts that you were sent, Art. Right. And what would you do? Who would you talk to? Who could you trust? What, What would you actually do with something like this? So we started asking those questions hypothetically, but seriously. Most people hung up. Most people, we called Air Force, we called the police, we called um, a lot of different groups who basically didn't want to have anything to do with it because they thought it's a prank. It's got to be a, some kind of a, a fraternity prank or something. Sure. But when we called the MUFON people, they were excited. They I were they, they were very were. happy. They gave us good information to not to tell anybody else, not to talk about it. They wanted to meet me in a public place. They asked if I could bring some of the pictures if I had had them developed. And uh, within a day, I had them developed. Within a day, okay. Yeah. And we, you know, photo processing, there was a lot of independent photo processors who who you could run the, the film up to and they'd have it to you, you know, in four or five hours. Right. So that's what we did. And uh, so anyway, consequently, we met with these people. I gave them a box of of things you know, pictures and some negatives and a few other things. You had an awful lot of proof. Yeah, yeah, I did at that time. 
and I gave it to them, and then they said, okay, well, here's, you know, another number for us. Call us back, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be definitely be talking to you by tomorrow at a certain time. Well, that time came and went. They never called.